everybody. Brandon Villarolo here with Tech Republic. And if you're anything like me, when you hear the words warp bubble, Star Trek immediately comes to mind. Unfortunately for us, we're nowhere near being an interplanetary species at this point, but a recent scientific discovery may have taken us one step significantly closer to the final frontier. Uh, with me today is Dr. Harold Sonny White, engineer and physicist, who was part of the team that discovered the bubble. Uh, Harold, Dr. White, thanks for joining me. Hey, thank you, Brandon. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah. So first thing I want to go into is, uh, as far as I understand, you weren't looking for a warp bubble. Is that correct? So what were you doing and what, uh, what did you actually find? And how did you find that warp bubble? That's a good question, right? Then sometimes, you know, I, I think this speaks to the value of doing basic research. Uh, uh, so Limitless Space Institute, you know, our, just a real quick background, our mission is to inspire and educate the next generation to travel beyond our solar system and to support the research and development of enabling technologies. And so that's a very, very bold uh, mission and vision. And so uh, part of what's necessary to kind of make something like those, that type of an objective possible is we, we have to have uh, breakthroughs in, in power and propulsion. And so there's several different ways you could potentially try and reduce that type of stuff to practice. Uh, one of which lives on the frontiers of physics, if you will, right? So if you think about what we know of physics today, uh, you know, you've got general relativity that kind of helps us understand the, the macroscopic world and quantum mechanics that helps us understand the microscopic world. But those two theories are, they're not uh, compatible. So we know there's a more generalized understanding to be developed. And so uh, some of the work that we're currently doing here at Limitless Space Institute, uh, as funded by DARPA Defense Science Office, uh, works on some stuff that fits very squarely in, in that domain, working on the frontiers of physics, if you will. We're trying to maybe general, you know, develop uh, some new insights into physics that might help us bridge the gap between you know, general relativity and, and quantum mechanics. And so um, the work that we're doing for DARPA is uh, trying to explore kind of like the fundamental nature of the, the quantum vacuum, if you will. Uh, specifically, the thing that we're interested in, in exploring is uh, there's a phenomenon in quantum mechanics known as the Casimir force, and I'll explain that in just a second. Uh, but the stuff that we're doing with the, the DARPA work is trying to figure out, can we make customized Casimir geometries, if you will, on, uh, and when I say <clears throat> uh, make them, we're talking about stuff that's very, very tiny. Yeah, they're about a micron or two in width, is that correct? Right, right. So it's uh, very, very small. And so to kind of use hand puppets to illustrate uh, a, a, just a, a Casimir cavity by itself, Casimir cavity is just basically two plates that are in, in very close proximity to one another, uh, a concept that was discovered back in the 40s by, by Casimir. And so um, <clears throat> the Casimir phenomena is a illustration of um, some peculiar nature of, of uh, reality at the microscopic level, right? Quantum mechanics tells us that, uh, uh, you know, the, the vacuum is not truly empty. There are virtual particles that uh, pop into and out of existence all the time. And so this, uh, this little concept known as a Casimir cavity, if you, if you could imagine having two, you know, two metal plates that are in very close proximity to one another, as you said, a couple microns, right? Uh, much smaller than a, a human hair. And you can put those two plates into a vacuum chamber and turn on the vacuum pumps and pull all, all of the air out. Uh, and then you could go through and imagine, hey, Brandon, Brandon has superpowers. He can go shrink himself down to being a, a tiny little atomic person and he can go kind of take a look at what's going on uh, in that vacuum chamber outside of the two plates and in the middle of the two plates. And your, your classical mechanics uh, expectation based on the, the big world that we live in is that uh, you would see zero pressure on the outside of the plates and zero pressure between the two plates. Uh, but what quantum mechanics predicts and what we observe when we do experiments is uh, there is a negative vacuum energy density between those two plates. Those two plates restrict which vacuum fluctuation modes can exist in between those two, and so there is a negative vacuum energy density between the uh, between the two plates. Uh, the the phenomenon was, I think, definitively measured for the, the scientific community satisfaction in the in the early '90s, uh, and it's been explored uh, significantly since then using things like uh, atomic force microscopes and things that can measure very very uh, tiny forces. So a little bit of background uh, to to get to the thing that we're looking at. So what we're doing is we're taking that phenomena that Casimir cavity concept, now we're adding some specific geometry in it. So in, in our case, the thing that we're predominantly focused on with DARPA is two parallel plates with uh, uh, pillars that stand in between those two plates. And so uh, the physics that we're working with, which is uh, something we would we, we categorize as a pilot wave theory, the, the specific parlance is a dynamic vacuum uh, model. We're trying to explore how the quantum vacuum is predicted to respond to the presence of these pillars that are in between these two plates. So it's like, think of two walls with like flagpoles in the middle, if you will. 
And so that's the that's what we've been working on uh, as part of our work with DARPA. There's some potential uh, power implications of this. There may be some possible uh, other technologies, you know, communications, maybe some new ways to sense things that we currently can't see. Uh, there may even be some propulsion uh, implications of this. And so that's what we were working on. We were working on that, uh, exclusively focused on that. And in the process of looking at this uh, custom Casimir cavity with these, these three pillars in between, when we looked at how the, the quantum vacuum responds to the presence of these shapes, when we took a, like a two-dimensional section cut of it, uh, the energy density distribution, this negative vacuum energy density, uh, looks very similar to what the, the, what's called the Okubia warp metric requires to manifest something we call, uh, in general relativity, a warp bubble. Right? So this is the, the whole concept that would allow you to you know, go to another star system really quickly. Uh, uh, so, but um, I'm familiar with it, having done work in that area before. And so uh, that really piqued our curiosity. But the, the concept was not, was not a, a, a good enough match because we were looking at prismatic shaped uh, energy densities. And what we needed was something that's toroidal, like a, like a ring or like a lifesaver, if you will. And so we, uh, we tweaked the model instead of just having two plates with pillars, we looked at a, a one micron diameter sphere in the middle of a four micron diameter uh, cylinder. And when we look at how the quantum vacuum responded to that structure, it manifested the toroidal ring of negative vacuum energy density that matches the requirements for the Alcubia warp metric. And so I think that's, uh, we published that in, in uh, EPJC. We, we really wanted to kind of highlight this to the community to say, hey, Here's a real structure that we could make uh, that is predicted to manifest a negative vacuum energy density uh, that uh, says that this should manifest a real nanoscale warp bubble. So if I understand warp bubbles correctly, uh, the basic concept, and this is, I mean, obviously I'm glossing over a lot of very complicated mathematics here in physics, but basically what you're, you're pinching the space in front and you're expanding the space in back. And if I understand that should cause what's in the bubble to be propelled forward eventually faster than the speed of light in terms of propulsion, correct? Yeah, I would, uh, I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to be a, a, a precise in, in the physics parlance. It would allow you to go somewhere effectively faster than the speed of light. Technically, you're never locally exceeding the speed of light. You're utilizing, this is like one of the two loopholes in physics, if you will, that, that uh, allow you to kind of deal with what I call the 11th commandment of physics, thou, thou shalt not exceed the speed of light. Uh, uh, you know, general relativity, the same mathematics that establishes the speed limit gives us two potential loopholes to maybe get around it. One is the idea of a wormhole, and the other is the idea of a space warp. And the space warp works on the fact that you can expand and contract space at any speed. Uh, when we look at the standard model of cosmology, there's this potentially inflationary phase that we see where, you know, as the universe expanded, there was a point where it actually manifested this at the, uh, at the universe's scale. So Fascinating. So, obviously, warp bubble, that term. When I say warp bubble, like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, it comes with a lot of baggage, pop culture baggage, right? This is a term that, because of Gene Roddenberry and the Star Trek universe, has become loaded with expectations when we hear it. So, you know, and obviously a lot of the coverage, even my article, has been focusing on that propulsion aspect because that's what people are interested in. Um, but, as we talked about earlier, and, and I want to talk about again, uh, there's a lot of things that this warp bubble isn't. So I want to specifically talk about like what it, what what isn't this warp bubble? Let's talk about what it you know what it can do or what we can do at this scale and what you know what sort of things are still kind of out of the realm of possibility. Right. So the the, the stuff that we talk about in our paper, where we document our numerical analysis about this structure that uh, one could make, uh, we we have not made it yet. We're still focused very much on the, on the, the custom Casimir cavities, uh, but you could make this and it would manifest a, a nanoscale warp bubble, and so. Some of the things that come to mind, just looking at it from a scientist perspective, there's a lot of other things we'd want to explore to try and understand the, the fundamental physics that's potentially at work. I mean, one of it would be optics, right? This, uh, uh, this um, manifestation of, of this little warp bubble would potentially affect uh, a, you know, all wavelengths of light in the exact same way. And so in some ways, what that makes me think of is maybe there could be uh, some optical applications for this. This could be uh, akin to some type of a broadband metamaterial. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not creative enough to come up with all the applications, but I know folks that work in optics might say, hey, if you have something that's broadband, I can, I can certainly make use of that because a lot of metamaterials are usually tailored to a specific uh, narrow frequency band, if you will. And so if you had something that affected a lot of things in the exact same way, that might, uh, that might have some, some interest. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think the other thing that we say very clearly in our, our paper 
and I've, I've given a couple talks of this as well as, you know, this thing's not going anywhere. So if we, if we built it and we went through and even measured it, right. Uh, it's not like this thing is zipping off to the, the nearest star or anything like that. Yeah. I imagine there's a lot of science that needs to be done before we can make one of these things mobile with any degree of, uh, uh, determination or anything. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, the, the parlance I try and use to temper people is that, you know, it's crawl, walk, run, right? You just, you have to take uh, small baby steps. And I, I like to think back to, um, as we were trying to figure out nuclear science, E equals MC squared, if you will, um, uh, in the process of trying to figure out how to, uh, uh, you know, harness and, and utilize the power of the atom, um, they conducted a test uh, underneath a, a squash court at the, I believe, the University of Chicago. It's called the Chicago Pile, uh, where they had a, a, a nuclear reactor um, that they went through and, and, and ran, and it generated a whopping half of a watt. Um, you know, and that was a very significant thing. It's called the Chicago, uh, Chicago Pile moment, right? Uh, um, and uh, so, you know, in, in, the, in the progression of any type of new idea, uh, you have to have these very modest things that come along long before you get to some uh, more uh, adventurous um, application, if you will. Now, you're quoted, I know, as saying that you don't think there's been a Chicago pile test for warp drive or warp yet. Do you think that this might be a Chicago pile moment for, for that kind of technology? I think this is, from, from the, uh, the numerical analysis perspective, this is definitely very significant. This is, uh, I think, the first time that we can say to the technical community, if you build this structure the way we, uh, we suggest that you build it, uh, it will manifest a negative vacuum energy density uh, that should, should, it should kind of uh, generate this spherical region that we would call a, a warp bubble. And it should have some interesting optical properties. So as a, as a matter of precedence, I think it's very significant. Because prior to this paper, no one could really say, well, what would we build to make something like this even something that we could test in a lab, right? And so that was, uh, uh, it, in our mind, that was significant, which is why we worked really hard to go through the, uh, the numerical analysis to make sure we understood it and then get it through the, the peer review process, so. So I know you said specifically that when it comes to this, you know, that was kind of a, you know, a serendipitous discovery. You're not working on warp bubbles right now. You're focusing on those Casimir cavities and, and their applications for DARPA. So I'm assuming that that means you're gonna continue to work with Casimir cavities uh, into the near future with this kind of as a, hey, here's this idea out here. Um, so are you hoping that people pick this up and run with it? And what are you hoping uh, people do with the findings in the near future? Is it those things like the optical properties and what have you? Well, and that is uh, that, that is definitely a, uh, an objective of, of articles that get published in the literature that are identifying some, you know, some theoretical understandings and uh, uh, that might have some, some initial pathways that one could try and piece together uh, to do some to do some type of empirical work, and so you know the hope is maybe some other people might want to go do you know duplicate the analysis that we did. Uh, maybe some folks would want to go see if they could make something like this. Um, but I think uh, the, the other thing that really probably needs to be done is what does the empirical ca campaign? What would it? What would an empirical campaign need to look like to be able to see something like this? And, and what strategy or tactics uh, could one take in the process of trying to? Uh, explicitly quantify this with laboratory equipment, right? Because in the, in the process of exploring anything that's, you know, on the frontiers of physics, you have to do a lot of hard work to try and eliminate, uh, you know, confounding things that might be in the lab, false positives and what have you, uh, and try and make sure you can kind of see what it is that you, you want to see and how does that compare to what the models are predicting. Well, I got one last question for you. Uh, and that's, of course, the one you're probably, you've probably heard a lot since you first made this discovery. And that's, you know, Propulsion. When? When? Right? When or what? What is this the sort of thing that we could expect? You know, in a, in a couple hundred years. I mean, technically, according to Star Trek, twenty sixty three was the year of the first warp flight. So, I mean, if you've laid the groundwork, we're about fifty years out, and we're right on time, as far as I can tell. So, any thoughts on that? <laughs> what, what, why is my part taking so long? Right? So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, um, <clears throat> I have no idea what the what the future would hold. I, I get this question a lot. Um, and I've gotten a lot in the past from some other work uh, that I've done. And um, I think the, the way I tend to uh, think about it is, you know, I, I, I can't predict the future, uh, but I, I think I have a good idea of what I need to be doing right now. And so right now we're, we're focused on, on exploring the custom casmere cavities and some of the physics we want to try and understand. Uh, maybe that could in, it, uh, provide some insight to the other stuff. I, I don't know, but we, we know we want to focus on that. Uh, and then we've got this other thing that we've put out there that uh, we may think about a little bit more and try and figure out could, what would be an empirical campaign that someone might want to do to go try and measure this in an in interesting and meaningful way. 
Um, and I, you know, I, I kind of pull back to, um, I had a, uh, this is something I got from a, a colleague of mine in the, in the industry, Andy Hoskins. Um, he was getting philosophical uh, one day over a, uh, at a birthday party, kind of uh, reflecting back on things and introduced me to this thing. So I, I've thought about this a lot, but, um, you know, when we think about uh, doing things together side by side, you know, in the here and now, that, that's a beautiful thing. And, and it's the value proposition of teamwork, but also there's value in doing things over time as well. You know, this generation does something, that generation does something, et cetera. Uh, and so the, you know, the great cathedrals of Europe are, are a, an interesting example of that. Um, I, I went to Strasbourg, France this uh, past summer and uh, taught some classes at the International Space University and got a chance to go see the, the Strasbourg Cathedral there. Uh, Strasbourg Cathedral, they started building it in 1100, just uh, 1100 uh, the time frame. They didn't finish it until sometime in the 1700s. Uh, and so that's a long time uh, to, to put into a project, if you will. And so but what that means is somebody built the basement or built the foundation uh, and they never saw the, the finished product, but they knew what they needed to do right then and there so that the next group of people that came along could do their part and the next group could do their part, et cetera. And this went on for several generations. And so I have no idea when, uh, but I know what I need to be doing now. And we'll just kind of focus on that. And hopefully some other people would be inspired to kind of get into the arena with us and, and try and, uh, you know, take a crack at it as well. Yeah, I hope so too. I'd hate to see this be the last of it, but I'm, I'm thrilled and I want to congratulate you again for this discovery. It seems like it's one of those things that's laying that groundwork in that basement for future generations to work on. So uh, here's hoping good things to come. Dr. White, thank you so much for, Sonny, thanks for joining me again. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you uh, hopefully again in the future with more great discoveries. Hey, hey, thank you, Brandon. I appreciate it. And if you want to read more about that warp bubble, you can check out Sonny's paper online or you can read more about it on techrepublic.com. Mm -hmm.